you will open your Bibles to the New Testament in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We don't usually deal with this passage because, frankly, the people opposing baptism for the remission of sins or the essentiality of baptism don't know enough about the Bible anymore to try to use this passage and twist it out of its context to oppose baptism. Maybe even some of our brethren don't know as they ought to know. But Paul, in writing to the church of Corinth, said in 1 Corinthians 1.17, For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And what do those who oppose baptism say about this passage is that, well, Jesus didn't send Paul to baptize. And the logic is supposed to be, and if he's an apostle of Christ, then we don't have to be baptized to be saved because the apostle of Christ was not sent to be baptized. And, of course, that is uh, just completely resting, W-R-E-S-T-I-N-G, resting this scripture, 1 Corinthians 1, 17, right out of its context and ignoring everything else the New Testament has to say about baptism. Well, it is a fact that Paul baptized some people. For he declares in this same context, I baptize none of you but Crispus and Gaius. And then he says, I baptized also the household of Stephanus. 1 Corinthians 1, 14 and 16. Now, this question to those who say that 1 Corinthians 1, 17 says that Paul was not sent to baptize, therefore one does not have to be baptized since an apostle was not sent to baptize. Will any of those contend that when Paul baptized these people, and he says he did, that he did something he wasn't supposed to do? When Christ gave the Great Commission, he certainly, certainly commanded that believers be baptized. He said in Matthew's account, Go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them. Language couldn't be clearer. Now, if Paul labored under the Great Commission, as did the other apostles of Jesus Christ, then he and all of them were commanded to baptize the believers. Now, we all know that Paul was faithful to what God sent him to do. He said to Timothy, inspired of the Holy Spirit, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. And he says it plainly, I have kept the faith. About right as plain as it gets. So, since Paul, the apostle of Christ, was faithful, it must follow that when he baptized believers, and under the Great Commission he would have, then Crispus, Gaius, and others which he did baptize, then he was doing what the Lord told him to do. In John chapter 12, in verse 44, the scripture reads that Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. Now the question I would ask people, do you believe on Jesus? And certainly those who are, would uphold the idea of believing in Christ only and that's all that's necessary, they would say certainly we believe in Jesus. But Jesus says in this passage, He that believeth on me Believeth not on me. This is where it helps to know a little bit about literature. I always thought, well, if you're going to understand English, it's good to be able to understand it and what's necessary to understand it. And I'll pause here and throw this in in the middle of this. If you're going to teach somebody the truth and he has an English Bible, do you think the Bible authorizes you to teach him English? Well, certainly. Certainly it does. 
And so we see the need of understanding some things, at least some things, about how the grammar in English works to convey a message. So surely everyone understands that this passage, and I get it because we don't hear this much, that this passage is what's called elliptical, elliptical. And we shall simply supply the ellipsis. He that believeth on me, believeth not on me only, but also on him that sent me. Everyone knows what I just said. If they know their Bible like they ought to, that what I just said is true. One cannot believe on Jesus without believing on God the Father. It's impossibility. In view of what the Bible teaches about these things. So as we go back to 1 Corinthians 1, 17, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. We see that Paul did baptize, and two, that he was faithful to the Great Commission and all other things God enjoined upon him to be a faithful child of God and do the work of the apostles were called to do. So the passage must be elliptical, and we supply the ellipsis. It will read, Christ sent me not to baptize only, but also to preach the gospel. That's where we're headed with this. That's exactly what he's saying when he says, Christ sent me not to baptize. In John 12, 44, he that believeth on me believeth not on me only, but also, also on him that sent me. There it is. Now, how do you read that, those passages, the way they are written and translated into English and not supply that in your own mind when you read it? Because that's what it means. 1 Corinthians 1, 14, Christ sent me not to baptize only, but also to preach the gospel. But if you're translating it, you have to render it into English as close as you can to just what the Holy Spirit said through Paul in Greek. So you do it like that. When you start supplying things, then in the King James and others, they tend to put it in italics so you'll know it's supplied. And that's important. And you don't want to see a whole lot of supplying of things <laughs> by the translators because when they do that, they are not translating not as closely as they could. That doesn't mean some things to say it in English as close as you can, like said in Greek or the case Hebrew, that you have to supply some words because it's just the way it is. You cannot. We strive for a word-for-word -word translation, but it's an impossibility to do it word-for-word -word because some words in Greek, are, say one word in Greek, to render it into English, to say in English exactly what it says in that one word, you may have to take three words. It's just the way the language works. To anyone who can read, then you know, not only from this passage, but from the totality of what the Bible says on water baptism, that Paul would have taught the truth on baptism and practiced it. After all, he wrote much of what is said on baptism. Now, Paul reached Corinth, if you remember, before his helpers, Silas and Timothy, did. You have to go back over to Acts 18 to find out about the establishment of the church in Corinth, verses 1 through 5. As the family of Stephanus was the first fruits, so he says, or converts, in the city of Corinth, 1 Corinthians 16, verse 15, I think it makes it clear those Paul baptized, that those Paul baptized were converted before his helpers arrived. With Paul, baptism was so important that he didn't neglect it. So in the absence of his helpers, he personally administered the baptism himself. And in holding gospel meetings, I don't think in any gospel meeting I've ever preached over all these years, when people responded to obey the gospel and be baptized, I don't think I have actually put one of them under the water. It was always somebody there at that congregation. And I can say it just like Paul did. The Lord didn't send me to baptize only. He sent me to, or, uh, but he sent me to also preach the gospel. And that's exactly how Paul means it. We can have helpers and do it all the time. You might say somebody, I've heard my grandmother say this years ago, say, well, so-and-so obeyed the gospel under the preaching of. 
But that did not mean that the preacher who did the preaching to which the person was persuaded to obey the gospel and be baptized did the actual baptizing. And they have. Well, certainly wouldn't be opposed to it any more than Paul would have. When all the circumstances then are considered, we actually see the importance that Paul attached to baptism. Because he's actually saying, before my helpers got there, I took care of it. And then, too, because some were calling themselves after the name of men, because Paul said the church there was carnal, they were very much in need of growing up in the faith. Paul was glad that circumstances had not made it necessary for him to baptize others. He inquires, were you baptized in the name of Paul? So he is teaching that one has no right to wear the name of one into whose name they have not been baptized. Nobody has a right to say I'm a Christian. If they've been brought to belief in Christ by the truth of the gospel, confess their faith in Christ, having repented of their sins, but then they won't be baptized. Paul's argument falls flat on its face if he says, I'm glad I didn't baptize many of you, although I did baptize these. Because you're so divided following different teachers, you'd say, I'd baptize my own name. Well, for that to have any force, then there must be force being baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit by the authority of Christ. You're the ones that have a right to wear the name Christian. And that's the very point that he's making. All the Corinthians that believed were baptized, according to Acts chapter 18, verse 8. So Paul's argument to show that they're following after teachers would have no merit if it wasn't important that you're baptized in the name of Christ before you can wear the name of Christ. And that's the reason we talk about the business of the plan of salvation I'm making sure that we teach the place of hearing the Word and why it's necessary to hear the Word and what happens when one hears the Word and the understanding that takes place from understanding the rightly divided Word and how that produces belief and what that belief is. And then one who's been persuaded by the truth to have belief in Christ as the Son of God, why that person then is commanded, Acts 17.30, to repent of sins and what it means to repent, what motivates one to repent. Therein you die to the practice of sin. And it's a dead person that you bury. And you bury them in the name of Christ to obtain the remission of sins because you're raised to walk and newness of life. And those people who teach that you bury a person saved at the point of belief are burying alive people. That won't work. It doesn't fit the divine pattern. And people can make light of a divine pattern or inspired blueprint all they want to. But that's just the way the authoritative word of God communicates the will of God to us. Words have meanings, and the Lord said what he meant and meant what he said. And it's up to us to make sure we're honest as we study the scriptures on things as simple as exactly when one is forgiven of his sins and becomes a Christian. You know, there was a time in this world, and then we'll stop here. There was a time in this world among people who believed in God and the Christ and the Holy Spirit and the Bible that didn't know a thing in the world about Hearing the word, believing, repenting of sins, confessing their faith in Christ, and being baptized. Yet they had the Bible for years and years and years. But as far as history records, only along about the time of in America of the early 1900s did people finally formulate that. Because they believed you had to take all of what the New Testament says that was necessary for the forgiveness of sins and not just one of them. And they're able to do that. If you're not a Christian, surely if you paid attention, you've at least had your mind uh, whetted to have the appetite to say, I want to be sure what he said is right, and you'll pursue it. But if you are a child of God, you see the need when you're studying with denominational people why you need to spend a lot of time on what it means to hear the Word, write the divine the Word, and every other step in the plan of salvation that's necessary to become a Christian. If you don't get those right, you will not become a Christian. You cannot obey from the heart that form of doctrine if you don't know the form of doctrine. And the form of doctrine is in the words of Christ. 
So to the person who is a believer and repented of sins and confessed one's faith in Christ, that person must be baptized for the remission of sins. As a child of God, if you sin, then we urge you to repent, confess those sins, and pray God's forgiveness. So if you're subject to the gospel call, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.